Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Tehami. Pakistan's relations with the United States had been stressed in the recent past, but now there is a thaw between Pakistan and the US after the recent high-level engagements between the top officials from Pakistan's side as well as the U.S. side. Uh, during uh, the 77th United Nations General Assembly session recently in New York, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif had a meeting and interaction with U.S. President Joe Biden and also Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari had an interaction with the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Anthony Blinken. And after the talks between the two counterparts, these talks were dubbed as productive. Not only this, uh, there had been a couple of other developments. Uh, uh, now, the U.S. had been uh, providing Pakistan with the vaccines uh, to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the statistics show that uh, 61.5 million doses by the U.S. been provided to Pakistan so far. And also the flood relief assistance has been provided by the U.S. Uh, to Pakistan with $56 million uh, to uh, mitigate the effects of the devastating floods Pakistan has recently been hit with. Additionally, $10 million in food security assistance has been provided by the U.S. to Pakistan. And in the first week of September, uh, an arms sale, uh, particularly focused on F-16 aircrafts, worth $450 million, have been uh, give, approved by the U.S. for Pakistan. And um, uh, now, Chief of Army Staff, General Kamajavid Bajwa, is also in the U.S. along with a high-level delegation, and he is expected to meet uh, with the top officials, including the Defense uh, Secretary General Lloyd Austin. But uh, this particular thaw in relationship between Pakistan and the U.S. seems to be worrying for India because there have been statements by the Indian External uh, Affairs Minister Mr. Jay Shankar, and especially when it comes to the uh, that approval of the $450 million uh, to Pakistan by the U.S. in terms of uh, uh, sustainability of the air, uh, F-16 air, aircraft fleet in Pakistan, uh, Mr. Jay Shankar said that U.S. position uh, regarding these, uh, this sale can't uh, fool anybody. We are also joined to discuss and delve deeper into various aspects of Pakistan and the U.S. relationship. Um, for that, we are joined by an esteemed panel of guests today, and uh, we are honored to have been joined by Dr. Ziaul Haq in the studio. He's Director, Peace and Conflict Studies, Center for Aerospace and Security Studies, and also we are being joined on the Skype by Mr. Murtaza Sulangi, senior journalist. We are also privileged to have been joined by Lieutenant General Retired Raza Mohammad Khan, former ambassador, National Defense University. We are also honored to have been joined on the phone line by Ambassador Mr. Ezaz Chaudhary, former ambassador to the U.S. Thank you very much, all of you gentlemen, uh, for your time at uh, Views on News. Let's begin the discussion with you. Uh, Dr. Ziaul Haq, how significant is this thaw in the relationship between Pakistan and the U.S., especially, especially when it comes to the recent interactions by the Pakistani top officials in the U.S. Uh, during uh, the U.N. General Assembly session? Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I think it was not unexpected. It was expected. Rather, in my opinion, it has uh, come a little late. Uh, the engagement should have started much earlier. Because it always surprises me whenever uh, there is a temporary breakup uh, of relationship between uh, Pakistan and US. Primarily because Pakistan is one country in the region which has always stood by U.S. in any war, any conflict in the region, be it the time of Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, there was only one country which steadfastly stood behind the cause of uh, liberating, I would say, Afghanistan from the Soviet number one. Second comes um, when 9-11 uh, happened. 
and Pakistan did not take long to side with the, uh, the US. And that is why it always surprised me whenever US tried to impose sanctions on Pakistan and asking for do more. It always surprised me and I, I don't see logic behind asking Pakistan to do more because Pakistan has done much more than Pakistan it has had done in much more uh, vis a vis whatever the interest the US Absolute. had, particularly in this region. Let's go to Ambassador Ezaz Chaudhary. Ambassador, what's your view regarding the recent engagements of the Pakistani top officials with the US officials? And uh, clearly, it seems to be a thaw of, after a couple of years of tense relationship between Pakistan and the US. Uh, I would say that um, in the recent months, the kind of uh, all we have seen in the relationship is a welcome development. I believe that not only the political leadership, but also the military leadership is now engaging with the U.S. And, and, and why not? Because uh, uh, for considerable sustained periods of time, Pakistan and U.S. have had a very close relationship. And it is a multifaceted relationship, although many would say that security extent is much stronger. But come to think of it, uh, U.S. is still a, the largest trading partner in counterterrorism. We have worked together in the economic uh, field. We have had corporate America investing in Pakistan for decades. And therefore, I personally feel that uh, uh, the tension that had arisen from the time of Donald Trump as the president of U.S. and which continued uh, for uh, sometime during Biden administration too, uh, is now receding. And we can see that a positive engagement is happening between the two countries. I can see also even on ground in Pakistan, you must have seen U.S. Ambassador uh, Donald Blom uh, circulating in various parts of Pakistan and also promoting, uh, uh, you know, friendship between the two countries. In your uh, preliminary remarks, you mentioned a number of um, areas where United States is a bit more forthcoming than it was. So my sense is that uh, these contacts uh, at the political level, when our foreign minister was there, when our prime minister was there, and now uh, when our army chief is there, this is a very welcome development. Pakistan wants to. There were two areas on which there are uh, there are still question marks. Uh, uh, U.S. still has that issue with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Pakistan-China uh, cooperation because uh, of the U.S. larger ob objective of uh, uh, China containment. And the second, the U.S. has pulled out of Afghanistan and it feels that Pakistan was not helpful uh, in uh, ensuring American victory. So these are the two Mr. Chaudhary, beg your pardon American for the interruption. Beg your pardon for the interruption. As you have yeah. highlighted two major irritants which still exist between Pakistan and the U.S. Uh, vis a vis China and Afghanistan, as uh, Dr. Ziaul Haq was already alluding to the fact that uh, despite Pakistan having done much for the U.S. over the number of decades, whether it was invasion by the Soviets uh, in Afghanistan and uh, whether it was war on terror and a number of other things as well, uh, the U.S. had always been asking Pakistan to do more. So what do you think? Uh, what has been the reason, the core reason uh, for this demand? I think the core reason is very simple. You see, after 9-11, the United States felt that Al-Qaeda based in Afghanistan was responsible for that terrorist attack. And therefore, they were out to achieve a military victory in Afghanistan, having punished those forces. But the U.S. thought that it was Pakistan providing sanctuaries to the Taliban and therefore they were not having victory. Whereas Pakistan was constantly pleading with the U.S. that there is no military solution. There is only a political solution, which eventually the United States came around to accept it because then they started talking to the Taliban, there was a deal, etc., etc. So I think even in the U.S. now, there is a realization, you would recall that before the Congressional Committee, even their, uh, uh, you know, Chairman John Chief had made a statement that we, in Afghanistan we made a strategic blunder. I think the blame game has stopped now because there is a realization in the U.S. 
Yes, yes, there was no military solution, and unnecessary. So, Pakistan, all this do more mantra is now, uh, you know, I don't hear it anymore. Nor should Pakistan accept it uh, ever. And the same goes for vis-a-vis -vis China. Why should now, Pakistan... Mr. Mr. Chaudhary, when it comes to yeah. uh, the uh, element of uh, Afghanistan in the entire equation of the Pakistan and the U.S. relationship, uh, we saw very unceremonious withdrawal of the foreign troops led by the U.S. and uh, the debacle of Kabul uh, and a peaceful takeover rather by the Taliban. Uh, after that, the relationship between Pakistan and the U.S. Soured. Now, uh, we have recently seen Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif urging the U.S. to unfreeze those assets of the Afghan government. Uh, do you think after this thaw, uh, the U.S. officials and the authorities are going to take a note uh, on a, uh, seriously about this call made by the Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif? I think to the extent of humanitarian assistance, yes. The U.S. will be inclined to channel some of the funds or allow the bank to, uh, to, uh, to you know, uh, funnel some of the funds for humanitarian assistance. But my sense is that U.S. has a much uh, larger issue at stake. One is the U.N. sanctions, 1267 regime against the Taliban. The other is the U.S. sanctions against the Taliban. I think the U.S. and the Europeans are not still sure to what extent the Taliban regime will honor the three commitments they had made. The commitment but of uh, Mr. Chaudhary, they had already had a deal with the U.S. and the international coalition forces in the form of Doha peace deal. Uh, as per that deal, they had recognized um, uh, the, uh, Afghan, uh, the Af uh, Afghan Taliban as the legitimate uh, uh, a group to uh, run the government over there in Afghanistan. No, I don't think so. I think if you read the deal of uh, February 2020, you would discover that there was an agreement to have an interim government, which will be inclusive, which will have uh, people from all factions. But then since the U.S. troops withdrew so quickly, and Pakistan had been uh, constantly telling them to have a responsible withdrawal, and we saw Ashraf Ghani government fold up very quickly as one national army melted away and that is why you see the Taliban becoming the de facto ruler. Now de facto ruler everybody wants to accept that. Pakistan too. But beyond that people expect that while the international community will walk half the mile, the Taliban will also have to walk the other half of the mile. But meanwhile on the humanitarian situation, on the economic situation and on running the government, I think Pakistan doesn't want to see Afghanistan descend into an anarchy or a chaos because we will suffer the region will come. Right, Mr. Chaudhary, one last question from you when it comes to uh, India. Why India seems to be worried when it comes to the resumption of ties between Pakistan and the U.S.? Most recently, uh, the um, uh, deal has been approved uh, worth $450 million focused basically on sustaining the F-16 fleet in Pakistan. Yeah, the uh, Indians uh, uh, have always taken this view that uh, any military engagement between Pakistan and the U.S. Uh, would allow the, uh, the equipment to be used against India. This is wrong because in the in this uh, sustainment package, it has been written very clearly that this uh, foreign military sales is only for counter-terrorism purposes because the United States can also see uh, what's happening in Afghanistan, how the terrorist entities are coming back and therefore they needed to bolster Pakistan's cap cap capacity to counter terrorism. So therefore, uh, uh, I don't think India has any locus standi to oppose it. If you listen to the external affairs minister, he says that the uh, uh, U.S. is fooling uh, others with, uh, uh, by saying that it is for counter terrorism and as if it will be used against them. I think uh, Indians are making uh, uh, you know, too much out of, of, out of this whole issue. Uh, I don't think Pakistan uh, um, is in any way uh, offensive towards India. In fact, if anything, India has been offensive towards Pakistan. Look at the uh, uh, September 2016 claim of the surgical strike and then February 2019 actual surgical strike committed by India. So therefore, aggression is, is to happen. It will happen from the, uh, from the Indian side. And I think we made it very clear to the Americans uh, that they should not be bluffed by... Uh, by the Indian uh, viewpoint. 
Right, your point is well taken. Mr. Ezaz Ahmed Chaudhry, Foreign Ambassador to the U.S., thank you very much for being on Views on much. News. We really appreciate your time. And now uh, let's bring in uh, Lieutenant General Retired Raza Muhammad Khan, former uh, President, National Defense University, is Defense Analyst. Uh, General Raza, why is this engagement between Pakistan and the U.S. officials, and especially when it comes to the approval of $450 million dollars for maintaining and sustaining the F-16 fleet in Pakistan is worrisome for India. Okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, let me uh, first say uh, very few, uh, and brief words about uh, the uh, Pakistan-U.S. Uh, uh, relationships history. You know, it goes back, dates back uh, to 1970 as far as uh, our digital to military relationship is concerned. When we were both part of uh, the CETO and CENTIP, uh, that ended unfortunately or fortunately in 1970. Uh, then uh, we are aware that uh, when the Soviet Union had invaded uh, Afghanistan, so for a decade, I think we have worked together. Mr. Uh, General Raza, uh, unfortunately we can't hear you because there seems to be a little bit of distortion of the signal. Let's uh, bring in Mr. Murtaza Sulangi. Uh, Mr. Sulangi, what's your take regarding the recent visit and the engagements of the Pakistani top officials with the U.S. officials? How fruitful these uh, engagements can do, you, do you think can be in, uh, in the near future? Well, the visit of uh, Army Chief uh, General Badwa comes uh, right on the heels of high-level engagement uh, between uh, the uh, top uh, officials of government of Pakistan, including the Prime Minister and uh, the Foreign Minister, Minister of State, and other officials in New York as well as in Washington. So it comes on the heels of uh, a kind of a thaw after uh, the frosting of relations between uh, United States and Pakistan uh, during the previous government, uh, uh, during uh, that tenure, you saw uh, a lot of stress and tension between uh, uh, both countries. Now, the current visit of Army Chief was not timed to be soon after this uh, high-level engagement in Washington and New York. Uh, my information is that Army Chief's visit was actually planned uh, and scheduled during uh, Imran Khan's government for various reasons. Uh, it was postponed almost three times, and it happens that it's taking place now. So uh, there's a lot of rumors, mongering, and misinformation on social media that uh, uh, Army Chief... Uh, uh, so visit uh, just before his retirement, uh, and there are a lot of rumors and uh, uh, misinformation going around. So I just wanted to uh, inform your viewers uh, how this visit has taken place. Now, uh, Pakistan and United States has uh, have had relationship in uh, multiple dimensions, uh, economy, uh, as uh, it was uh, right, rightly pointed out. Uh, United States is the largest uh, export destination of Pakistan. That's a matter of record. Um, when you need every dollar for uh, your exports. Now, right, right, Mr. Uh, Sulangi, I beg your pardon, but I'd like to contest this particular point because, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, U.S. remains to be the largest destination for Pakistani exports, but uh, the imports from the U.S. to Pakistan always superseded, especially when we talk about last couple of years. Imports have superseded exports. Do you think there is any margin? What areas would you like to specify in which Pakistan can enhance uh, its uh, exports to the U.S.? Let, let, let's focus on the visit of Army Chief. Pakistan and United States have a long military relationship. We have, uh, General Raza uh, would tell you that we have multiple military platforms that we constantly need spares and service, including F-16, including uh, naval equipment and air equipment. So uh, the, the visit of Army Chief uh, in uh, United States is very much needed uh, and it will help us, uh, including this uh, dispelling this impression what 
Indians were trying to create about this uh, uh, 450 million dollars spares for F-16. Um, although we have had, we saw the uh, statement of uh, Secretary of State uh, dispelling that impression. So you need to reinforce that. And uh, while it was uh, already pointed out by our uh, government officials, uh, Army Chief's visit will uh, help uh, uh, to reinforce the constant supply of uh, right. spares that we right. need. Right, Mr. Sulangi, your point is well taken. General Raza, uh, when we talk about this particular uh, deal between Pakistan and uh, the U.S., now, uh, Secretary Blinken has categorically said it is not a, a, a nothing, something new. Uh, it is already, uh, it is to support already existing fleet, whatever Pakistan already has. Uh, and it is basically focused on um, countering the th terror threat emanating from the region. So why, uh, when uh, Secretary Blinken talks about uh, this particular deal being approved for Pakistan in order to counter the terrorism threat, why does India seem to be worried about it? Uh, look, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, please go ahead. All right. Uh, you know, first, this is just a very small component uh, of the... Uh, Pakistan Armed Forces and uh, uh, the U.S. relationship. Uh, and I think we have talked enough about that. Uh, let me say that uh, actually uh, it is regional stability uh, that both countries are going to discuss because that is in the interest of uh, both countries. Uh, they are going to discuss fighting international terrorists, uh, whether they are in Afghanistan or elsewhere. They are going to discuss... Uh, combating narcotic production uh, and trafficking, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, uh, they, they will be uh, doing communications uh, to improve mutual understanding. Uh, we are going to talk about how uh, the countries can uh, support each other uh, so that we are more secure than we were uh, in the past. We are also going to share uh, Pakistani concerns with them, uh, you know, uh, of uh, the unconditional support uh, by the United States and India uh, on many issues. They have been condoning uh, the Indian human rights violations uh, in Kashmir, the Islamophobia, uh, in rising Islamophobia in, in India. Uh, of course, we are going to explain to them our positions and our compulsions uh, of our relations with all countries of the world, uh, including Russia. Uh, then uh, uh, there are many other things, you know, the issue uh, of the cipher and uh, how it is politicized, and I think that needs to be clarified. Uh, but finally, uh, I think uh, we are going to promote and protect our mutual interests. Now, there may be clashes, you know, within uh, those interests, uh, and therefore, uh, once, you know, high level civil or military relation, uh, uh, officials are there, then these are the bigger issues that they're going to discuss. As far as, you know, the sale of uh, spare parts of X-16 uh, is concerned, uh, well, uh, it is a sale agreement that has been approved uh, by the U.S. Congress and subsequently by the State Department. Uh, it is not a grant. We are going to pay for that. Uh, so, and, well, this is a good gesture from the United States. Uh, and they are obligated to keep all the weapons and equipment provided uh, to all countries in the world. That includes Pakistan. And that was stated by the U.S. Secretary also in response, you know, to the Indian uh, objections about that. Uh, so I hope I have clarified you know, some of the doubts uh, and the questions raised by you. Right, right. Uh, General Raza, your point is well taken. Uh, Dr. Ziaul Haq, why does India seem to be worried uh, uh, in regard to this particular sale? Um, do you think uh, India's relations with the U.S. Uh, over time has deteriorated because of their more engagements towards Russia and their purchase of weaponry from Russia as well and their um, undecisive stance regarding uh, Russian conflict with Ukraine? No, I don't think so. India is already enjoying uh, and having a free ride with the U.S. as well as Russia. And uh, after having signed this uh, Beka agreement, India has become a strategic partner of the U.S. and a very, very important ally in the Asia-Pacific. 
So, actually India's concern always there whenever Pakistan gets anything either from US, European countries or China. It has to make UN cry just to tell the world that the strategic imbalance will take place if Pakistan gets F-16 or if Pakistan gets JF-17 upgraded or something. As far as this 450 million dollar uh, US assistance is concerned, this is, uh, General Raza has rightly said that we are paying for it, number one. Number two, this is for the sustenance of the F-16 fleet. So there is nothing extra or we are not adding any value to our existing fleet. And uh, India's UN cry is only at the diplomatic level. Now, well, Indian uh, Minister for External Affairs, Mr. Jay Shankar, has said that when it comes to uh, the deal of F-16 aircraft, the kind of capability has got and the positioning uh, they have got, so that happens to be an apprehension and concern for them. Your take? They, uh, their apprehension is 500% correct. They know it from the incident of February 27, 2019. No Indian will ever forget it, especially Indian Air Force will never forget it, okay? What Pakistan Air Force did on that day, Alhamdulillah. My point about Jay Shankar is that you are very fond of um, interpreting IT as international terrorism instead of in information technology. Well, my take on that is that IT in that sense is Indian terrorism, not international terrorism. It is Indian terrorism in the held Kashmir, occupied Kashmir and that is how we see it and that, that, that is how most of the world sees it, but does not speak only because of Indian clout and because of India's overwhelming um, what do you say, stature in the world politics at this time. Otherwise, Indian terror activities in the Alt Kashmir right. is well known. Right. Uh, uh, let's bring in Mr. Sulangi. Mr. Sulangi, when it comes to a U.S.-India relationship, we have seen concerns being raised by the U.S. a number of times when it comes to dealing with the core human values, including the human rights and the freedom of expression, freedom of uh, speech, as well as freedom of uh, uh, observing one's uh, religion. Uh, there have been a passing of the controversial laws in India, which have been uh, uh, seen uh, with concern in the U.S. Uh, at the same time, we have seen more engagement of India uh, with Russia and their undecisive sort of a stance towards the Ukraine crisis. And when it comes to India, uh, the United States depending on India for containment of China, so the U.S. doesn't clearly seem to be happy with India's behavior. Well, <coughs> United States has to protect its own uh, national interests and they will do so. So should we. Every country does that. Uh, when it comes to human rights uh, standards and values, um, I would not count on what State Department says about India or Pakistan. I would go and uh, watch and read the reports of uh, credible human rights bodies like uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. They have put volumes upon volumes of uh, uh, data and information uh, on uh, what human rights violations uh, take place in India, uh, including occupied Kashmir. So, um, you know, US has been uh, releasing a, a report uh, by the State Department every year on religious freedoms. They issue reports about Pakistan as well. Uh, I don't know how much importance would we give to them. So I would not, you know, uh, you know, burn my midnight oil on what the United States says. So, uh, General Raza, what's your take when it comes to the statements of Indian Minister for External Affairs? Uh, he says, quote, there are many more regions where we will be intersecting vis-a-vis -vis Russia is giving this statement with American interests. It is to our mutual benefit that this be a complementary process, unquote. That this be a complementary process, that uh, is it a sort of a warning to the U.S. authorities? I think uh, uh, we need to just ignore the statement. Uh, they've been giving such statements in the past as well. Uh, 
so I think that is all that I will have to say. Further to that, I think we should come back about uh, and talk more about Pakistan-US relationship. Uh, and let me say, you know, that right now, Afghanistan is very unstable. This is, uh, you know, of great concern both to Pakistan uh, as well as to the United States. The United States does not have an embassy in Kabul like it had happened, you know, when the Soviet Union uh, left Afghanistan. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think that they, uh, do, uh, their ambassador right now uh, is in, in Doha. And there's a small component uh, uh, which is looking after their interests. Uh, so I think uh, uh, that is of concern to us because, again, if something flares up, uh, then uh, in the past Pakistan has been blamed, although Pakistan is doing everything that uh, it can. Uh, and uh, it has facilitated, you know, uh, the Doha dialogue and so many other things. But unfortunately, uh, it was not uh, acknowledged. I will again come back to the military mil to military cooperation between the United States and Pakistan, which is actually institut in institutionalized and has been going on uh, irrespect of the changes, uh, you know, uh, in the politics uh, of the two countries, uh, because uh, I think both countries are aware uh, that it is important uh, to pr protect and promote the national security interests of the two countries. Uh, there have been military exchange programs between the two, and I think I'm sure the chief of army staff uh, is going to discuss that and enhancing uh, that program. Uh, we are under sanctions, uh, you know, for uh, many more things, uh, and I think those sanctions uh, to the military supplies, weapons, equipments, uh, and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, wherewithal uh, needs to be lifted up. Uh, and, uh, you know, we right now we know that the United States is cooperating with India uh, in every possible field uh, and it is uh, arming India. Uh, and while it says uh, that it, it likes to work with Pakistan in promoting non-proliferation, uh, proliferation, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the way it is helping uh, India, it is actually disturbing uh, the regional uh, peace and stability. And similarly, even non-proliferation. So again, that is a major concern, which I am sure so, will General be discussed. Sir, I beg your pardon for the interruption. When you say that uh, um, uh, there are so many other sanctions in different fields and they should be lifted uh, when it comes to Pakistan's purchase of the weaponry and different other stuff related to it, uh, do you think this particular visit by the Chief of Army Staff, General Kamajavid Bajwa, is going to be a precursor to lifting of those sanctions most probably in future, in near future? I am. I do not know, but uh, I am sure. You know, uh, these are our concerns. As, as the United States is actually, I said in the past, it is obligated that if it has sold a certain equipment, uh, I think uh, it is not right to put any kind of sanctions uh, on that uh, uh, weapons or equipment, whether they are small uh, or they are big. Then again, uh, I think uh, the, the U.S. attitude towards the CPEC uh, would be discussed. We are aware that the CPEC uh, is being, uh, you know, attacked uh, by India time and again. And uh, we have evidence uh, to show the, to the United States uh, that the CPEC across the political divide is the vital national interest of Pakistan. Uh, and if there are any attacks on that from the Indian sides, then the United States must exercise its influence to prevent India from doing that. And it should so, also... No, uh, General, General Raza, when we talk about BRI and the flagship of which is the CPAC, don't you think it remains to be a sort of uh, a, an irritant for the U.S. authorities when it comes to their policy of containing China's growing strength? Well, they, they can do that. I mean, they should actually be competing with China, uh, not confronting them. That is what we would like to advise them. And Pakistani uh, political leadership have always said that we'd like to actually act as a bridge uh, you know, to uh, reduce these differences between the United States uh, uh, and China. Uh, and uh, therefore, you know, let me tell you that uh, if the CPEC, inshallah, will succeed, and because of that, Pakistan is going to emerge stronger, both right. militarily and politically. And when that happens, then I think Pakistan will be in a much better position to protect and promote our common interest, which I said earlier, is to bring in and ensure regional stability and fighting international terrorists.
Right. When it comes for Pakistan to maintain a balance uh, of its relationship towards the U.S. and China, Dr. Ziaul Haq, how can Pakistan uh, maintain that balance? Actually, Pakistan has to look at its own national interest. Because Pakistan has served enough U.S. interest in the region. And when they say do more, I say that Pakistan should only reply back by saying done most. We have already done much more than and we already have our plate full. We cannot go any extra mile. Look, half of the country is under floods, isn't it? We have other obligations. We have to look after the well-being of our own people. We are not against U.S. But at the same time, Pakistan's economy is also under immense stress. Absolutely. So for that, you need assistance and help from that's the partners I'm, as that's well, what I'm including coming the U.S. That's so what you I'm just can't at. negate that element entirely from the uh, I am entire coming to equation. That. I am coming to that. We do not want to have a spoiled relationship with the U.S. Because we are the most sincere ally of United States in this region. Ever since the days of Seattle and Centro, the Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan's visit of 1951, ever since, we are the most sincere ally and we have been mostly punished after every task that was accomplished by US or the task was over, Pakistan was punished. Why do you think Pakistan, uh, the uh, relationship uh, turned out to be tense between Pakistan and the US, especially after the Taliban takeover of Kabul, despite Pakistan having played a crucial role in the Doha peace deal, in bringing the Taliban on the negotiating table, as well as in the entire peace, Afghan peace and reconciliation efforts? Because the Biden administration has been wrongly advised. When they came in, the Doha agreement had already taken place. And they were given 14 months to withdraw. That was perhaps 31st May. So when Biden came in, he asked for some extra time. And it was granted. It was the Afghan government of the time, that is Ashraf Ghani's regime, which just folded itself and left. Isn't it? And the Afghan National Army, which had been trained for 20 years by the US, it just melted away. So you, Pakistan you, did not So you mean to say it was the failure on the part of the international coalition forces, but Pakistan was scape, uh, scapegoated? Pakistan remained steadfastly behind uh, US. You'd see the Pakistan uh, embassy's uh, role in evacuating all foreigners from Kabul at that time, when Taliban were uh, heading towards Kabul. Pakistan played immensely important role and everybody was safely evacuated from there. And many countries thanked the government at that so, time. Uh, what can Pakistan now do if Pakistan can bring the Taliban on the negotiating table and uh, we could see the manifestation in the form of Doha peace deal and then eventually uh, the withdrawal of the foreign forces from Afghanistan. Now at this time when Afghanistan is faced with dire humanitarian crisis uh, around 90% as Bilawal Bhutto Zadar, the foreign minister of Pakistan has um, uh, given a call in the US that more than 90% people might fall below the poverty line. So what Pakistan can now do in order to avert that catastrophic situation that is uh, developing over there? The, uh, I've been consistently saying that Pakistan has done more than anybody else. For Afghanistan, for but US. But if Pakistan stops what? doing more from this side of the border, uh, Pakistan is going to be affected more. Because if the things are not right in Afghanistan, Afghanistan is not peaceful and stable. So it is going to have a ripple effect on Pakistan as well. Absolutely. But it is the responsibility of international community to assist Taliban government. And that will only happen when people realize, international community led by US realize that Taliban are a reality. They made agreement with Taliban, isn't it? And now they are ruling Afghanistan, they must be assisted, they must be helped because their country was destroyed for two decades, isn't it? And they, they have won a war, they have won a war against two superpowers in last 40 years. They need to be recognized 
and they need to be assisted. But they made some promises. Let's, uh, let's bring in Mr. Sulangi. Uh, Afghan Taliban made some promises in that Doha peace deal. Uh, uh, perhaps they are not fulfilling. There are apprehensions by the world powers, including the US. That's why the recognition of the Afghan uh, Taliban is not being done, hasn't been done as yet. And that is uh, uh, automatically creating problems for the Afghan people over there. It's and just not the apprehensions of uh, the world community. We have our own apprehensions, rightly pointed out by Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif in the UN General Assembly, that uh, not only the world community has some expectations, as mentioned uh, in the Doha Agreement, um, in terms of uh, representative government and you know minorities and women and whatnot, but they also have a commitment not to allow Afghan soil to be used against any other country, including Pakistan. And look what happened after that. What Afghan government officials have said, and our foreign office had to clarify, and uh, uh, not only clarify, but uh, give a rejoinder that, you know, it's unfortunate. Mr. So, Solangi, you know, Mr. Solangi, uh, I'd like to uh, contest this particular point. Uh, when you are taking the government and uh, there had been corruption that was rampant during Ashraf Ghani's government as well as the Hamid Karzai's government, uh, when a new government comes in, it definitely needs resources to run the affairs of the state. But whatever was present uh, in the banks, th that was frozen. How do you think the interim Afghan government can deal with the crisis situation? And the crisis is not one. Uh, there are many crises to dealt with. Well, there are multiple crises in Afghanistan, and it's Afghanistan's problem. But Afghanistan must not allow its soil to be used against Pakistan. Pakistan shall not accept that. Pakistan has done enough for Afghanistan. Pakistan has done enough for Afghan Taliban who are ruling now. And they had made commitments with Pakistan that they will not allow uh, their soil to be used against us. So they, if there, Mr. There, Sulangi, there have been a couple there, of incidents in the recent is, past that the Afghan... There is, if there is corruption in Afghanistan, it's not Islamabad's problem. It's their problem. Let Mr. Afghan Solangi, what makes you say whatever is the problem inside Afghanistan is not the problem of Pakistan because it directly affects Pakistan. We see the refugee exodus as well and then Pakistan has to bear that uh, price as well and then we see the ripple effect of terrorism as well. Once the things are I'm not stable in Afghanistan, how can Pakistan feel secure from its I'm, western border? I'm talking I am talking about the corruption issue that you just raised. Every country has its set of problems. We, have, we don't have corruption. We do. So is Afghanistan going to talk about it? No. Our problem is our own national security. We shall not allow any we country shall not. Pakistan to doesn't use allow the use of Afghan soil to be used against Pakistan in particular and uh, for any other country as per the Doha peace deal. General Raza, what's your take? Uh, should we uh, put boots down on the ground on Afghan soil once again in order to uh, neutralize that threat that emanates from Afghanistan right now after the international uh, troops withdrawal from there? Uh, the brief answer to that is no. But let me uh, say very emphatically that I totally support what Mr. Solangi has said. Uh, and you know, while uh, we keep supporting and uh, we keep uh, advocating uh, for the resumption of Afghan aid internationally and uh, even in the uh, OIT conference, look at what uh, the Afghan response is. It was only three days back that the Afghan Deputy Foreign Minister, Mr. Stanik Zing, I think he blamed Pakistan for something which was absolutely incorrect. They should actually formally apologize. The Foreign Office must apologize to Pakistan for such statements, which I would consider uh, were unwarranted and very unhelpful. Uh, and of course, you know, now the TPP has found a safe heaven there in Afghanistan. That is our contest, our concern. And I think that concern would also have been sounded uh, to uh, to the United States uh, and to rest of the world. They have actually an obligation. They have committed 
not only to Pakistan, but to the rest of the world, that their territory will not be used against any country, including Afghanistan, and that is not happening. Finally, I would like, you know, right now for the U.S. to help and assist Pakistan, you know, in uh, rescheduling our loan, whether uh, they are from the IMF or from the World Bank, uh, and help us in getting out finally from the FATF. Uh, and under that is done, I think our relationship is going to stay transactional, uh, you know, uh, as it has been in the past. Right. Uh, when it comes to um, restructuring of debts, what sort of role the U.S. can play? Already is, it is assisting Pakistan in the flood relief efforts. Now, uh, there is an additional announcement for the food security as well. And President Joe Biden uh, clearly made a fervent appeal at the U.N. General Assembly of helping Pakistan out uh, to deal with these floods. And uh, he also said that the U.S. is also going to continue to help Pakistan in this particular thing. What more do you think the U.S. can do? Okay, if that question is to me, I think uh, yeah, General, all, those it's... Measures, yes, all those measures uh, have been highly appreciated, uh, I think, uh, by the people of Pakistan and the, and the political leadership of Pakistan. They must continue. But as the UN Secretary General had said, uh, they are uh, too little, too less. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think uh, in this matter, as I said, what the US uh, and its allies can do more uh, is to prevail upon the IMF and the World Bank uh, and, uh, you know, others uh, now to reschedule our debts. We are grateful right. to the United States that it has already rescheduled, I think, uh, over $30 million. Uh, and uh, I think that's the start. But I think uh, more needs to be done uh, by them uh, to ensure that uh, the, the entire region, particularly Afghanistan uh, and uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Pakistan, remain as stable uh, as uh, as it could be for, for right. the interest of countries. Right. General Raza, unfortunately, we are short of time. Mr. Sulangi, your brief take on this particular thing, the idea which was uh, put forth by United Nations Secretary General of uh, debt swaps uh, for um, restructuring the debt for a country like Pakistan in order to build the disaster resilient infrastructure, how the U.S. specifically can invest in this domain in Pakistan? Well, U.S. and other countries uh, who are major creditors uh, in a case uh, like Pakistan, they must uh, uh, help Pakistan because uh, you have seen uh, the initial estimates are over $30 billion losses uh, due to these uh, torrential rains and floods. And, uh, you know, our contribution in, in, uh, in this climate change is almost negligible. So it will only be a climate justice if uh, those countries, uh, you know, uh, do the right thing uh, as suggested by the UN Secretary General. Right. Uh, Dr. Ziaulak, your brief take on this. How can the U.S. help in this domain? Uh, Actually, there is no doubt that U.S. controls most of the international financial institutions. And it can influence them because this is a serious humanitarian crisis. But let me quote uh, my friend Dr. Chohan, who says that Pakistan is a sober society. Whenever Pakistan gets into crisis, it does not create hue and cry to the international community. It does not create emergency. It does not call for emergency assistance. It tells the world that we are facing this problem. Please come and help. Right. Right. Dr. Ziaul Haq, Director, Peace and Conflict Studies Center for Aerospace and Security Studies. Thank you very much for being at the show. We really appreciate your time. We were also joined by Mr. Murtaza Sulangi, Senior Journalist and Lieutenant General Retired Raza Mohammad Khan, former President of National Defense University on Skype. Thank you very much for your time for being on the show, both of you gentlemen. With this note, we come to the end of today's discussion. Pakistan and the U.S. ties uh, have been a little tense over the last couple of years, but now we have seen a thaw after the high-level engagements between the Pakistani authorities and the top U.S. officials. And the U.S. has made a lot of pledges in order to help Pakistan, especially deal uh, with the impacts of climate change and the recent devastating floods. A lot um, lies ahead between Pakistan and the U.S. And uh, with uh, the time to come, we'll see what Pakistan 
can do for the U.S. and what specifically the U.S. can do for Pakistan. With that note, we come to the end of today's show. Until the next one, take very good care of yourselves.